I welcome everybody to our publication launch. Hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you join us from. We are so happy that, here, that you are here with us today for the launch of our publication From Transition to Transformation, Strengthening Women's Effective Participation in Peacebuilding and Transitional Justice Processes. Insights from Colombia, Nepal, and the Philippines. Um, before we come to the introductions, I would already now like to thank everyone who contributed to the publication and contributes to today's event. Specifically, all authors of the publication and the organizations that were part of it, and then also our guests today, and also the interpreters Janine and Kat, who make it possible that we can hold the event in two languages. Now everyone who was involved with the project and has a part today will present themselves really briefly. And we'll start actually with Susan, I give the word to you. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Namaste, everyone. I'm from Nepal. I am Susan Rizal. And I have been working in the organization called Nagari Kawas. It's a peace building organization. And we are a partner of peace women across the globe and also one of the authors uh, for this publication, um, where we try to you know, bring the voices of the, especially in the conflict of affected women whom we work with and looking forward for our for further discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Karen? Uh, peace to all. I'm Karen Tanyada from GZO Peace Institute. Our NGO has been supporting the engagement of civil society in peace processes to end the armed conflicts in the Philippines. We are working especially with women and youth uh, organizations and networks. And we have, we're happy and fortunate to participate in this project on amplifying the role of women in transitional justice. Uh, good day to all. Thank you, Karen. Yasmin? Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yasmin Usman Lau, um, founding chairperson of the Al Bujadila Development Foundation, a Muslim women's organization based in Arab City, Ubar, Bangsamoro, uh, and also Nisa Ulhaki, Bangsamoro, um, part of the peace negotiating panel for the Cross with the MIF and currently consultant to GCO for this particular project. Uh, salam Thank you, Yasmin. Bueno, buenos días eh, para todos. Gracias por este espacio. Good morning to all. Thanks so much for this space. My name is Salome Gomez. And I've been participating in the women's social movement in Colombia for two decades now. I am come from Cauca Department in Colombia. And since 2018, I've been part of the Truth Commission. And I'm coordinating the gender working group there. It was a group, of course, that was formed thanks to the activism of the women's movement in Colombia. So thanks so much for the invitation to participate in this process through different in different regions in Colombia. And I'm glad to be here accompanying you today. Thank you. Thank you, Salome. And I think now, Socorro, your microphone works, I can see. Socorro? Sí. Yeah, sí, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Bueno, soy Corrales, My name is Socorro Corrales. And I come from the Comunitar team, which is a feminist organization. We've been working for more than 30 years in what we call territorial peace. And we see women as the principal actors of building democracy in the country. Thank you, Socorro. Tekla? 
Hola. Tecla, I don't hear you. Do other people hear you? No? No. Yeah, perfect. Okay, maybe it's the, this microphone that is not working. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. My name is Tekla Namachanja Wanjala. I'm calling you from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm a former commissioner with the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission, uh, a vice chair and acting chair. And now I support social healing among communities that were affected by armed conflict through an organization called SCODE. Pleasure to meet you all. Pleasure to have you with us, Tekla. Mitra? Um, yes, I'm very happy to be here today with all of you. Uh, my name is Mitra Bave. I'm project coordinator at Peace Women Across the Globe and responsible for our for the cooperation with our partners in Colombia, Nepal, and the Philippines. And in this frame also, I facilitated the exchange process, which culminated in the publication we are going to present here today, together with my colleague, Andrea Filippi. And I'm happy to continue the process of exchange and, and, and learning. Thank you. Thank you. And my name is Andrea Filippi. I also work at Peace Women Across the Globe and as Mitra just said, also supported the, um, this project and the publication writing as part of this joint learning process. So that's really nice. Thanks to all of you for, for quickly uh, presenting yourself. Then we are gonna continue with um, the key insights. Mitra, could you share the presentation, please. Perfect, thanks so much. <clears throat> so before we come to the key insights from the publication, I would also like to introduce to you the project background. The project that this publication is based on is part of the Women's Peace Tables program of Peace Women Across the Globe. The Women's Peace Table program started in 2015 with a pilot phase. It was largely campaign based with one of Women Peace Tables per year, um, every year, and it took place in many different contexts. The aim was to strengthen women's participation in peace processes and to make women's peace work visible. This program went on like this until 2017 and Peace Women Across the Globe and its partners organized more than 60 women peace tables during that time. We then redeveloped the program based on the lessons learned and experiences during the pilot phase. Together with our partners Comunitar, Nagarik Awas and the Gaston Z. Ortigas Peace Institute, we designed a longer term project named Strengthening Women's Effective Participation in Conflict Transformation. The starting point of that project is that while women are generally well represented in grassroots and civil society organizations, formal peace processes and transitional justice mechanisms tend to exclude women and communities facing multiple discrimination to a large extent. This is where the Mention Project comes in. It wants to use the windows of opportunity that peace processes offer, contribute to increasing the access of conflict affected women and conflict survivors to transitional justice and reconciliation mechanisms, tackle exclusionary power structure that hinder access to peace processes, and ultimately contribute towards transformative change. Surely you ask yourself, what are women's peace tables actually? So for us, this is not only the name of our program, it's also a method. Women peace tables are safer spaces. They provide space and time for 
in-depth exchange of experiences and also the building of networks. Women Peace Tables are also a space for trainings and workshops on, trans on transitional justice mechanisms because we realized that access to information is really crucial in order to strengthen the participation of women in such processes. Furthermore, Women Peace Tables are also spaces to jointly develop advocacy, spaces to develop common strategies to build feminist, gender sensitive peace and tackle those exclusionary power structures. To give you a little image, I brought you some um, photos. So these are pictures from the Philippines. These are from Nepal. And the next slide are photos from Colombia. So as you could see, actually in the first picture, there, there was also a Zoom, a Zoom call. So here you can see how, how COVID affected, affected this project as well. So what does this mean in concrete terms <clears throat> for, for the mentioned project? There were through, uh, three to seven women peace tables on the local level each year in each country and one annual uh, women peace tables at the national level. The demands and the findings from the local women peace tables were then carried to the national women peace tables, where decision makers and stakeholders also participated. So women peace tables are also a space for de developing advocacy. An aim is also always to sensitize decision makers to the necessity of incorporating gender justice into policy making. The project also included a joint learning process, which was already mentioned before, and from which this publication results. Can you show us the next slide? Thank you. Um, to give you <clears throat> an image of actually what the, what the projects meant, I have here some quotes from participants. So the first one is from a participant in Cauca, Colombia. The person said, here is a place where we can give free rein to our feelings, grief, but also relief that we are not alone. Another participant from Nepal said, I had never attended, attended any programs before where our issues and experiences were prioritized. The opportunity that I got to hear and share each other's story has made me realize that I am not alone in this journey. In the next quote, you also see nicely, I think, this link to the, to the advocacy level. A participant from Nepal said, we demand recognition. We demand our voices to be heard. We demand security. We demand <clears throat> a future for our children. We demand truth. And we demand justice now. So this nicely shows how actually this uh, demands that participants from the Women's Peace Table had were carried onto the national Women's Peace Tables where decision makers also participated and could actually hear those demands. I would <clears throat> now like to come to the writing process. So as I said before, the insights from this joint learning process are gathered in the publication we are launching today. We developed this publication together in a participatory manner. And from the outset of the project in 2018, there were regular online meetings and then a face-to-face -face meeting in Switzerland in Bern in 2019. We were then supposed to have another face-to-face -face meeting, but due to COVID, this had to be canceled. Instead, we met several times virtually in 2021 to develop the publication together. The pandemic presented us with challenges such as this one, but it was also actually an opportunity for us to meet more often, even if it was only online. We wrote this publication without a shared language, which was a challenge too. But with the help of Kat and Janine, who are interpreting now as well, and also other translators, we managed nevertheless to write it in those two languages. 
So writing the publication collectively was a challenging process, but also an enriching one. The many meetings we had allowed us to share experiences and learn from each other. What struck me is that despite different contexts, there are nevertheless similarities and common patterns, but also differences. So this joint learning process was also a steep learning journey for me personally, actually. Apart from the fact that the process allowed us to gain new insights and inspiration, what was valued about our gatherings too was a sense of care and solidarity, which gave us new strength and energy. After this brief overview over the process, I would now like to give over to Socorro, who will present our key takeaways and final reflections. Bueno, queremos entonces resaltar de este proceso como las reflexiones. Like to highlight from this process the different central aspects. One is a third, the three countries and the intercultural dialogue that we were able to carry out jointly and that peace is the path forward but what path this path means participation this could be a path that has challenges that have spines because there are you know, threats and, and challenges that requires a lot of listening reflection creativity this is hard work to share emotions and provide psychosocial accompaniment. This is a diverse and pluralistic participation that reflected the diversity of the countries, not just in relation to the number of countries, but that each country also has cultural and linguistic, political and populational diversity. So this is a situation where the women could feel like they were actors, that they were participants that were recognized as individuals who have knowledge and experience. There seems to be some audio challenges. There are many questions. The audio quality is not sufficient to continue the interpretation. Apparently, the audio quality of Socorro is not great. Let me check if she, if she is actually still here. Socorro, maybe, maybe you can maybe you can try without without the video because um, apparently the, the connection was a bit bad. We couldn't hear really well. Maybe it works now. I'm not sure if you're frozen. I oh, know. Bueno, un trabajo de mucha concertación de establecer the audio quality is insufficient to can you the interpretation okay socorro socorro i think the audio quality is bad could you could you try without the video uh mitra could you say this could you say this in uh, in spanish quickly to socorro socorro te están pidiendo que dejes de usar la cámara a ver si funciona mejor el audio porque no te escuchamos Si puedes retomar la exposición solo con el audio. We're going to see if we can go forward with just the presentation without the video. Please turn off your video. So hopefully with that, the 
the connection will be more stable. Okay. Thanks very Hopefully much. that's better. And sorry to everyone, even if we train in advance, there are always technical difficulties in the end. Al siguiente. Es, bueno, aparte de todas, la siguiente, Mitra. Next slide, please, Mitra. No pasan las diapositivas, bueno. En, 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 en el fondo es un entretejido de redes interculturales. So this was an interweaving of networks with cross-cultural, psychosocial, and political support where the women felt that they were legitimate as people who were able to carry out their peace practices, that they were vessels of knowledge that sustain life. And they were weaving the organizational social fabric to continue moving forward. This was work where you could see the potential of each of the women from their differences and challenges, but also with their more specific territorial, organizational, political, and personal individual and family needs. It was also a process that was full of challenges. There were huge challenges on how to have this be a sustainable long-term emancipatory and creative process where we could carry out a deep-seated critical analysis that looks at the roots of violence against women that goes beyond in armed conflict but also recognizing all the different stages of women's lives and different cycles where they have experienced violence this is a permanent cycle of violence and also we talked about how the pandemic affected women and how it increased the discrimination, the work burden in their home and their communities, and also for their personal and family health, and how we can understand how these different violences intersect and the characteristics and expressions of discrimination due to racism, uh, the ethnic representation, the age or region, and how poverty has a significant impact specifically when they're tied and to violence and these women are victims of so many conflicts when we see that there's different hate crimes and expressions that belittle women where they are discriminated against because of their their gender diversity or their ethnic diversity. And so how can we have community monitoring where the women can share and move forward their peace agendas from the territories and their organizations? This oversight makes it possible to establish responsibilities and require the government to fulfill the agreements in this transition towards comprehensive justice for peace. One of the challenges that we must continue working on, once again, going to the roots of the structural violence against women. What we see is that this was a process, as the women have mentioned, that stimulated memory. The women went back to their memories, their life stories, their experiences, their cultural practices, their spirituality, and all of the work that allows them to resist in the face of barbary and to carry out their social agency. This was very important work because of experience of these different peace tables, which was accompanied by the Truth Commission, allowed for a deep-seated experience that collects and reflects the experience of women in the armed conflict and how we can move from war to peace. There was also ongoing accountability it's essential that the government not only shows political will, but that this will is shown through the budget allocations, women's participation in the peace agenda and acknowledgement of their knowledge and providing 
agency to the women, that there's respect and fulfillment of the human rights, the human rights standards and resolution 1325, where there can be an ongoing dialogue and ongoing reflections to ensure that women's demands as peace actors is positioned and that we can have participation with greater guarantees and tranquility from the regions and territories and that we don't feel threatened because we are demanding deep-seated and radical transformations. So how can we do this? We have some questions that continue to be important challenges. How can we truly plan as women and women's organizations of victims? How can we learn to work from an intersectional perspective and also demanding the government and the state to take into account this intersectionality? This isn't just you know checking off a box with women's participation, just having a specific number of women. No, we need to transform our daily lives, society, mentalities, and different organizational initiatives that if we don't want to continue in violence, we need to carry out restorative processes that are based on non-repetition. These daily experiences won't disappear just because the weapons have been laid down or peace agreements have been signed. Truly, there needs to be ongoing, reflexive, and really forceful daily actions that call for this transformation of the warlike, violent, discriminatory, mindset. This has meant finally a mobilization, not just of collectives, groups, and dif distinct expressions of LGBTIQ groups, Palenquera, Black, youth, urban women, but also a mobilization of thoughts, of knowledge, of practices, of initiatives and creativity so that in the face of abusive power, we can continue resisting and that we won't allow for ongoing impunity in relation to the fulfillment of all the different international treaties that have been signed. It's important to recognize that women have been actors and we have continued to use our knowledge in response to push back on the different armed actors. So these emancipatory processes need to counter these painful and harmful processes that have been naturalized in our society that continue to abuse and hurt women. So this work has been a goal of the feminist organizations, not because it's just women feminists who are interested in peace, but because this has been a process of lessons and reflections. We're not just calling for gender parity, but we're calling for a radical reflection of who we are as a society. We need to make known that there are different ways of thinking and acting, and there are different ways to think from the communities and the territories and the organizations and specifically from the perspective and ideas of women. This has meant that once again, saying that we need to eradicate the sexist, homophobic, consumer-based, classist practices, that this is essentially um, emotional extractivism, not just of our natural resources, but also our knowledge and in humanization of a society that tries to um, simplify the diversity of cultures and life. And so we have carried out intercultural dialogues to highlight the importance of these different voices. Cooperation has been key, not just technically and economically, but because this has been an, a frank, open, creative dialogue from different perspectives and countries and tongues and cosmovisions. This has allowed us to express how we are truly part of nature and we are part of this creative process 
and how to Together, jointly from diverse perspectives, we continue carrying out international oversight based on cooperation and dialogue. So in summary, this is a focus on cultural transformation. This is a structural transformation with gender sensitivity, which is more than just saying that we are women who are diverse, but also being sensitive and being empathetic empathetic and to listening to the other individuals where we can learn more about the rights to to diversity that there's a decentralization not just of economic resources but also of the power structures and that the women's organizations have guarantees resources and protection so that they can generate through the work and they can generate policies that are more adapted to the organizational needs and they can generate institutional practices and educational practices that can receive this legacy that we have been working on for so many years and from so many countries to think about true peace that truly moves the power structures that have been so harmful to us all and so lastly Thank you to all the leaders who have trusted this process and who have participated with their voices, with their thoughts, their proposal, and their pain, but also with their organizational capacities. We also like to thank the Truth Commission of Women Around the World in the three different countries, and specifically um, the Gender Working Group with their strategies, their investigation and research, a team in the territories and the diversity of methodologies and work that they have carried out to jointly implement this peace tables and that peace women across the globe who have allowed for this ongoing work and ongoing interaction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Socorro, for this comprehensive presentation of our final reflections. I would now like to give over to Mitra for the next part of this event. Um, yes, thank you so much, Andrea and Socorro, for presenting, uh, for presenting a little bit the publication. Um, yeah, before we will open um, for a Q&A session, um, We'll just start uh, with some question to our podium guests, Tekla Namajan, Javan Jala, Salome Gomez Corrales, and Yasmin Busran Lau. Um, and I'm very happy that you're here today with us and, and sharing your experiences. I think what we already heard when you presented yourself that all of you have a background in the women's movement. At the same time, all of you had important posts also in formal peace processes. And this was also one of the questions in, in our learning process or, or in the publication, how we can better um, bring these processes together. So it's really great that you're here today. I would like to start um, with some question for Tekla Namajanja Vanjala. Um, Tekla, as you already introduced yourself, you have been acting chair of the Kenyan Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission installed during the Kenyan peace process from 2008 until 2013. And I would also like to mention that Tekla, you're one of the thousand women nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005, uh, where our network, our organizations, uh, give birth, let's say it like that. Um, Tekla, the Kenyan, uh, the Kenyan context was not part of, of the publication. So we would be interested in, let's say in your outside view from a different uh, conflict context. When reading the report, could you detect similarities or common patterns also valid for the Kenyan context? Um, maybe if you could highlight some of them for us. Uh, use mute. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you, my sisters, for allowing me in your space. 
And because of the network problem here too, I would like to uh, turn off my uh, video so that at least uh, we can effectively uh, hear each other if I'm allowed. Uh, to start with, I would like to really appreciate all the women who facilitated and participated in the Women Peace Tables. Indeed, this enabled women to harness their voices and amplify them for them to be noticed. Uh, through the Women Peace Table meetings, women have been able to claim their space from what I read to influence high level policies and contribute to the decisions made that affect gender issues and conflict transformation. And reading the Colombian, Nepal, and the Philippine cases, I find a lot of similarities with the Kenyan context. And due to time limitation, I would focus on these similarities in relation to the truth-seeking process, which was the mechanism that was chosen of dealing with the past. Uh, to start with, I would like to highlight uh, the historical injustices and gross violation of human rights. Uh, like the three cases, a section of Kenyans, like the three cases in the study have suffered a history of human rights abuses and other historical injustices, which included rape and other forms of sexual violence. Most of the sexual violence women suffered went unreported in Kenya because of, it's a taboo in Kenya to talk about sexual matters. Uh, in the case of domestic violence, the violations were not taken seriously by the patriarchal uh, society, which condoned a culture of violence against women. Unfortunately, women missed out in most decision-making structures, including uh, religious institutions that mediate in such a, a violences. So that is one similarity that I picked. Then there is the transitional moment after a long history of uh, injustices, cross violation of human rights that communities, including women suffered. It became, there came a moment of transition and this moment of transition was uh, preceded by uh, a mediation process. Uh, like in Kenya, uh, after an intense violence, we had the mediation process uh, headed by the late uh, Kofi, His Excellency Kofi Annan with the uh, eminent uh, personalities. Now, around this process, the women captured the moment this is where, like in the other cases, women captured the moment. The negotiations, although were between parties in the conflict, uh, that is women politicians, whose uh, negotiation was as hardcore as the men's negotiations. However, women participated in the mediation process through an eminent African women, woman who was part of the late Kofi Annani mediation team. And this is uh, Her Excellency, Madam Gracia Marshall, the first lady of South Africa. So through her, we pushed the issues of gender-based violence on the negotiating table. We wanted the outcome also to deal with the historical injustices that women have really suffered. Apart from the women movement, very next to the negotiating process, there was another group that influenced the outcome, influence the outcome of the peace accord. This group called itself uh, Concerned Citizen uh, Peace, for Concerned Citizens for Peace. This group composed of really high level diplomats, peace builders, uh, human rights actors, but I'm really highlighting it here because it was a woman who headed this process, the late Decker, Ibrahim, and it acted as a kitchen through which really uh, the issues that were negotiated were cooked, only to be taken to the table for the consumption by the high level mediators. So this is how uh, women participated and how we claimed our space. 
Now, after the mediation process, like in the three case studies that I've listened to and read, came the peace accords. Now, the peace agreements that were born out of uh, this mediated negotiation process is another similarity I find, and uh, where really now uh, women's issues were highlighted. From the peace accords came the truth-seeking process, and with uh, the peace-seeking the peace seeking processes, uh, which was a favored mechanism of dealing with, with the past, we see women issues now finding themselves um, at the front line. For example, in Kenya, uh, the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission Act provided that the commission puts in place special arrangements and adopt specific me mechanisms and procedures to address experiences of women, children, persons with disability, and other vulnerable groups. So uh, because of this uh, special section in the act, for example, in the Kenyan situation, uh, a special support department was set up. And this special department ensured that the situation or, and experiences of these vulnerable groups, number one among them being women, were addressed, adequately addressed in all the process of the commission. And through this special uh, unit, it coordinated the provision of counseling, of counseling services to the victims, especially women, catering for their welfare, including accommodation and, and travels. And it ensured that uh, 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 we learned from the past that women really did not participate so much in the truth-seeking process. So for us to ensure that women and other uh, my minority genders participate in the process, the, we organized a special hearing for women. It was termed uh, a conversation with women. And it was a, a de, a, now during this conversation with the women, we ensured that it was only female uh, commissioners who participated in this so that women can freely talk. And in situations of uh, violations, as I read in the reports, at times women shy away to, to talk about issues of sexuality. And so for us to provide this, there was an in-camera session where women uh, who really felt that they can talk in privacy, they were given that uh, occasion. And also to ensure that there is full participation of women, we had a thematic session on women alone. And so quite a number of women participated in the TGRC process because of these special provisions. Looking at the act again, uh, for the first time, uh, issues of uh, sexual violation was considered as crime against humanity. And we were not allowed to provide amnesty for this uh, offense uh, that are gross violation of human rights. So again, while in the past, we, sexual violation against women went unnoticed, this time even amnesty was not allowed for, for that. And it's on this truth seeking process uh, with the support of facilitation of others that we really saw meaningful participation of women in the process, right from the apex, looking at the commissioners out of nine, four were women, uh, the vice chair was a woman, the CEO was a woman, out of the seven departments that were set up, seven of them including finance and admin, documentation and information, and others were headed, four out of seven were headed by, by women. And looking at the staff, we ensured that at any one point, we maintained 40% of them being women, and at the senior level, 50%. Looking at even the statement takers, from the report uh, that I read, women shy away to just give anybody the information. Looking at the statement takers, we ensured we had quite a number of them of female gender. In fact, we had 191 female statement takers compared to 113 male statement takers. 
So this is the process, the mechanisms that we put in place to ensure that women participate. Now, when it comes to the TGRC report and gender, uh, sexual violations were really given prominence. Out of 40,000 statements, over 1,000 statements were received from adults concerning sexual violations. Out of the 1,000, 103 were given by men, others were given by women. Now, combined with other memorandums, statements and memorandums, a total of 2,646 women really came forward to share about the sexual violence that uh, they have, uh, they experienced. So uh, these are the mechanisms that were put in place to ensure that women came before uh, the commission. And so the historical record was that the commission wrote ensured that women issues were highlighted. And we would not have really uh, achieved this had we not cooperated with other civil society, uh, especially women groups, right from the statement taking, like in the three cases, we have some of the communities living in really remote, inaccessible places. And for those ones, we partnered with the institutions uh, who can reach there. For example, action aid, uh, religious institutions to, to reach the women and get the statements. Then, because the issues of children, these are special issues. Uh, commissioners did not have uh, really a lot of knowledge, but we have institutions that are working on issues of children, uh, child protection. We partnered with them to ensure that we get the right statement to capture the violations that children are uh, suffered. People living with disability, uh, we also had groups to support us. And the UN, where we were limited with finances, UN women supported uh, some of the institutions to engage in civic education, just to ensure that women participate in the process, gender issues, highlighting gender issues, even defining what is gender. In Kenya, when we talk about gender, like what was highlighted in your report, it's just men and women. These others fall through. So it's through such a institutions like UN Women that they came forward to support us to embrace these other genders and get to understand them. Then we have Nairobi Women Hospital that's really focused on uh, supporting uh, gender-based violence that journeyed with the process throughout to ensure that they support psychosocial uh, support to the people. And then of course we have the peace building networks that supported that. So we did really a good job. We came up with a good report, but unfortunately my sisters, the report is stuck in parliament up to now. A question was raised, how was the report uh, received? I, I usually look at the picture when we were handing over the report uh, to the president, and I feel like it was um, a mourning and grieving session. Of course, uh, political leaders who are adversely mentioned and implicated in the report refuted. Some immediately went to before the media to deny the allegations. Uh, some immediately took uh, complaints to court against commissioners for having uh, damaged their reputation. And when we even gave some cash to the government printer to print more copies, they printed very voluminous one paged, one sided page uh, document. You can imagine over 2000 pages and one side that you look at it, you are just discouraged uh, to read. So and for me, I saw that as a, a sabotage, but the report was received well uh, by most of the civil society with a lot of enthusiasm. Some of them went straight away to retreat to discuss the findings. Others helped us to come up with a abridged copy, a small copy which, can, which was reader uh, friendly. Of course, others had skepticism, but when they read the report, they were shocked at the findings. So as much as women issues were highlighted, 
we thought this was the changing uh, process for, for the women. The report is still stuck in parliament. Recommendations have not been implemented up to now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, dear Tekla, for, for sharing with us your experiences. And I think this also shows that a peace process does not stop with a peace process or a report from a truth commission. And so I would like to do the switch to the Colombian truth commission. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm happy that Salome uh, is with us to share um, the experiences of the Colombian Truth Commission um, or the Commission uh, for the Clarification, Truth, Coexistence and Non-Repetition. Um, and you will go to uh, publish your final report this June, which is quite soon. And I guess you're very under pressure now. Um, and well, the Colombian Truth Commission had a mandate uh, for three years, which have uh, been extended now until July 2022, due also due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, it is a very short term to collect testimonies from over 50 years of armed conflict and then develop a sustainable final report. Um, so, Salome, to fulfill your mandate, the gender working group had strong ties with women's and civil society organizations as well. For example, all of the women's peace table organized in, in Colombia have been organized in close cooperation with the gender working group. You will also find more information on that in our publication. But could you please tell us uh, more about this collaboration um, in the process of collecting testimonials from your point of view from the Chandler Working Group. Bueno, pues nuevamente buenos días eh, para todas, para todos. So once again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this space. I feel honored to participate in this space to share our experiences together with Tekla and Jasmine, and also warm greetings from the name of Alejandra Mila Restrepo, who would have loved to have been here, but due to her role as the commissioner and the limited time that we have left as the Truth Commission, she is not able to be with us today. So first off, I would like to thank and recognize this process. It's, this is the first transitional justice process in the world that does have is an obligation in its mandate and its three components in the Truth Commission, in the Special Jurisdiction for Peace and the Search Unit for Individuals Assumed to be Disappeared. They must guarantee the gender perspective and guaranteeing a gender perspective ensures or means ensuring the pluralistic and broad and participation of women who have been victims of the armed conflict and the diversity of organized and unorganized um, populations. This has meant, uh, signified a challenge, specifically at the beginning of the Truth Commission's actions. First, we created a gender working group so as to be able to carry out this participatory exercise uh, and to motivate women's participation. Fortunately, in Colombia, such as in the other experiences, the women's movement has had uh, an ongoing struggle and has defended uh, the peace process to guarantee this gender perspective. And this has allowed us to ensure that in 2019, there would be a dialogue with the women's organizations. And we have found we've had accompaniment from, um, from peace women across the globe, which was carrying out um, actions internationally and we were invited to participate. Thank you, Socorro, for her pre previous words. And the actions of the Ruta Pacifico of Women has had important actions in Colombia, and they have collected in the past testimonies uh, from women that were then used by the Truth Commission. And this has allowed us 
to have a close dialogue and based on trust. And so from the commission, what we did was to identify the major organizations, women's coalitions, and also um, organizations of the LGBTIQ population. The mandate calls us to guarantee the participation of people with diverse sexual identities, orientations, and expressions. And so we began dialoguing with Organ women's organizations of victims, whether they're peasants, um, black women, indigenous women. I think it's important to note that working with women from their diversity has been a challenge, but we did this together with organizations that have previous experience in the regions that know the territories and they had already been preparing um, the space for the actions of the Truth Commission. And so we're able to carry out territorial gatherings to listen to women specifically. Uh, we started with what they expected from the Truth Commission and how we could guarantee greater participation from the women. And so this meant that victims of different um, armed groups and victimizing acts, you know, women who have been victims for more than 50 years during this armed conflict could talk to the Truth Commission, telling them not only what had happened to them and what they expected of the Truth Commission, but they could also talk about their resistance and transformation processes for peace and how women, regardless of everything that they've suffered over this long conflict, have been in their regions defending first their lives, but also defending the lives and the well-being of their families and their communities and their territories. And these women are the people who have made it possible possible that today in the commission that there is a large number of testimonies that we are able to collect and um, talking to women made it possible through their organizational initiatives to generate trust and that the women would be able to listen to each other and that they could tell us in in safe spaces the specific um, incidents and human rights violations that they experienced in the context of the conflict, but not only in the context of the armed conflict. It's also important to note that from the gender group and listening to the organizations, we realized that it was necessary. It was very, very important to also talk about the violence that women have experienced outside of the Colombian armed conflict which have been exacerbated by the armed conflict. And so we decided it would be very important to talk about these other violences that women were experiencing in their family or community contexts, and that these incidents of violence were things that continued to be repeated. And that is why it was also so important to talk about these issues and to provide recommendations of non-repetition. So these activities have allowed us you know, as of 2019, when we were preparing our actions, we were able to listen to women to hear what they expected from the Truth Commission. And we were also able to go into the territory. And if we you know, hadn't had this close relationship with the women, maybe we wouldn't have been able to hear the voices of these women. And this also allowed us to work in as networks with other organizations. Many women's and victims organizations in the country didn't know each other, hadn't been in contact. And so this made it possible to you know, expand in democracy. This is an exercise that's part of the, you know, the fight for the for peace is an expansion of democracy in Colombia. And I think it also made it possible to realize, for example, and some silenced truths. These silenced truths, such as the ongoing violence that I had mentioned before, they show how the Colombian state has, has not protected women's rights. And this has allowed for the armed actors to go into the regions and that the women were re-victimized and there wasn't a state that guaranteed their, their rights as women. So these, the peace table processes, I think, um, leave a, a challenge to the Truth Commission and the future. So 
we will be providing our final report in July of this year. And so, you know, sharing this legacy with the organizations and this report is something that well, we're very sure that the Truth Commission, in the Truth Commission, there'll be the women who are the, the first um, and most important allies of this truth and the first people who will really appropriate and will receive the report and read the report and share that information through pedagogical activities. We think that the report that we've written together with you, with the organizations that have accompanied us, we hope that it will reach the most distant and um, areas. We need it to go to the home, the schools, and the workplaces of all of the women. And we know that the women will be very um, active in doing this in their regions. We also want to say that these activities of listening and having a dialogue between organizations has made it possible to show the state how the Colombian state should carry out its work in a different way with the organizations, with the social movement, with the victims. They've always thought that this has been a, a state that you know has a well-being focus and response to the needs of the population. But from the commission, we've carried out activities where we have been able to show that the women are subjects of rights and that it's impossible to have full truth in Colombia without listening to women in relation to what has happened to them and without recognizing their transformation processes in favor of peace and from resistance. So I think due to the time restrictions, I will stop there in relation to that question, Mirta. So thank you so much for opening up the space, for listening to me and for carrying out this dialogue process. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear Salome. And yeah, we could go much more in depth, but <laughs> as time is running, uh, yeah, we will uh, turn to Yasmin, Yasmin Busran Lau. Um, I'm very happy that you are here with us uh, as well today. Yasmin, you have been member of the Philippine government peace negotiation panel for the talks with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, MILF from Mindanao. And I guess this is a particular case in the Philippines as you yourself, you are from Mindanao, um, having been engaged also in the national women's peace movement. And then you became somehow part of the Philippine government um in in the negotiation process so i can imagine that this was also quite a challenging role so could you tell us a bit more about your relation with the women's movement during the negotiation process well uh thank you very much mitra and uh salam alaikum uh greetings of peace for everyone uh, yes, uh, yeah, on that note, on being a moral myself and negotiating on the other side is uh, also another story, yeah, which we can maybe discuss uh, some other time. But uh, because of uh, the limitation of time, uh, I would like to focus my response on your question on the relation, our relation to the women's peace movement. Well, I guess for those who have been uh, following the Philippine peace process, would the notice that uh, women played very prominent role in the negotiating panel um, uh, in the peace process itself. Uh, first with the, the presidential advisor on the peace process uh, to the president is uh, a woman, no? Secretary Teresita Pintos Deles. And then the chair of the peace negotiating panel, uh, Professor Miriam Coronel Ferrer, who, uh, after the signing of the agreement became the first woman in the world to have signed a major uh, peace agreement and uh, with myself as a member of her panel. And then our uh, legal team um, uh, headed by uh, young women uh, with 60% uh, of the support staff also women. And I, I think around two thirds of the co-conveners or co-chairs of the different of the technical working groups and the different mechanisms created were also women. So uh, 
you can see how prominent uh, the role of the women are. And also on the MLF side, uh, there were also two women in their technical panel. And most of these women uh, come from the women's movement themselves before crossing, to the gov uh, crossing over to government. And they have, each of them have their own, her story of being in the front line of actively engaging and supporting the peace negotiations uh, both the both uh, with the Moro Bangsamoro Front and the other front, which is the National Democratic Front, and uh, they've started engaging this peace process since the establishment of the democratic government after the martial law of uh, Ferdinand Marcos. So, as such, we can say that we had a very close collaboration between the negotiating panels and the women's organizations and networks. Uh, knowing them, having become part of them, uh, we ensure that they are with us every step of the way. Um, by regularly consulting with them, we would talk with them before we proceed to Kuala Lumpur, where we had our uh, negotiation, and after we returned. So there's this very uh, constant, uh, we've been very transparent with them. And as I've said, we ensure that they're with us every step of the way. And so their inputs were brought, we, we, we brought their inputs in the negotiating table. And as such, uh, their inputs, uh, in, important inputs, uh, some of them were included in the peace agreement such as the provision on the right of the women to, uh, for meaningful political participation, uh, the gender and development budget, among other uh, provisions. Um, we can, I, I, I would like also to say that whenever we encounter challenges in the talks that sometimes would uh, seem that we have reached a difficult uh, uh, stage, the women organizations were always there to push, um, encourage, and inspire us to continue and motivate us to continue. They opened avenues for dialogues. They held rallies. And they uh, did important lobbying uh, so that we would have the peace agreement signed and then this agreement, most importantly, be translated into law. So that's how uh, we as members of the panel uh, were closely collaborating with the women's organization. Thank you, Mitra. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for, for sharing these experiences with us. Um, well, now, uh, the peace process with the MLF culminated in the creation of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region for Muslim Mindanao Barim in early 2019, um, with a transition period extended now until 2025. Um, and this is also a time to, to where the transitional justice process will, will be implemented. Um, Yasmin, after your mandate at the negotiation table, you also you you continued your or you continuing your engagement on the civil society level and with women's groups, and you also uh, actively involved in the women's peace tables in in the Philippines. Um, what is your motivation for this engagement, and and what can be the role of the women's peace tables or similar initiatives? in this crucial time of transition from your point of view? Well, of course, I want to ensure that the peace agreement does not end in vain. You know, we've already had the agreement and as you've mentioned, there's already the law and the Bangsamoro Transition Authority is already in place. The Bangsamoro political entity is already in place. So we're already, you know, uh, uh, there and so I, I really uh, my motivation is to ensure that the agreement does not end in vain and this is it for me the end of moral insurgency and the beginning of lasting peace in my homeland 
you know, uh, we cannot afford to have another conflict or another peace process. This, as uh, my other panelists mentioned, the agreement is a paper, but that needs to be sincerely implemented by both uh, parties. And for me, the beginning of actual peace building is when communities begin to transform themselves into peaceful and productive uh, communities. And that's why the women's uh, peace table will have to continue also as a process. You know, uh, they, they were there pre-agreement and they have to be there post-agreement until such that we reach the desired state where we are both uh, confident that our we and our families and communities can continue to live in peace. Being the sector mostly affected by the evils of the war, women will have to continue not just to watch how the agreement is being implemented, but as well as to actively engage in the implementation uh, of, the, of the agreement. Uh, a good example that we are seeing right now, uh, together with uh, uh, We Act and of course, uh, Gaston Peace or, uh, Institute with Karen, is that the women are actively participating in the crafting of the election code to ensure that the gains of the peace agreement, particularly on the right of women for meaningful political participation is generally implemented. So that is mainly the motivation that I have, you know, uh, to ensure that the process continues on until we reach the stage where we, everybody is uh, confident enough to say that uh, we have reached the desired um, peace that we want. And so the women peace tables should also continue uh, and not just stop because we had the peace agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin, and to all of you, I see there are no questions so far in the Q and A chat. So um, please put your questions in there. But so I will use the moment um, to, to with another questions to all of you because when preparing um, the panels uh, with you, Salome, Yasmin, and Tekla, all of you, you also underlined the importance of international support in, in, in these processes, which sometimes is just there during the peace process and, and then it switches away. So maybe all of you could briefly just let us know what, what are your expectations and wishes from the international community in this moment of processes you are, as we hear also in the, in the international setting. Um, I don't know, Yasmin, would you like to continue and then we... Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, if you look at the peace ar architecture of the Philippine uh, uh, peace uh, process, uh, the international community uh, played very important role, uh, starting with the Malaysian third party uh, facilitator. We also have the international contact group composing of NGOs, non-government organization, as well as states, uh, part of the contact group. Then we also have the ceasefire mechanisms, which has also an international component to ensure that, that the ceasefire holds and stays while we're talking. You know, I think um, one of the main problem with some of the peace process is that while the negotiators are talking in the, in the formal table, shooting continues on the ground. So it's, it's quite difficult to negotiate while the, the shooting goes on. So the mechanism uh, for uh, ceasefire also had an international component. And uh, also uh, the rehabilitation and rebuilding of the camps, uh, the commissioning of the combatants. So the international community were part of all of this. 
held our hand no uh, and joined us with this journey and i would like to to urge the international community to continue this journey uh, with us um, until we reach in the in the agreement we talk about the exit agreement wherein it says all the provisions in the in the agreement and what's provided for in the law has been uh, met and so this would mean that we have the confidence that the mechanisms for non-recurrence of war, because I think that's what we want to arrive at, uh, the guarantee of non-recurrence. Uh, we want the international community to help us achieve that level where there is the, the guarantees for our mechanisms for non-recurrence is um, strongly, institution, strongly institutionalized within the Bangsamoro government, uh, as well as in the national government. And so uh, I, I urge the, the international community, as I've said, uh, we are just beginning to build the peace after the agreement uh, has been signed and the law. So uh, please be with us all, all the way. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Yasmin. Maybe afterwards we could uh, look. What does it mean be with us? <laughs> but I will, I will go further with the other Salome. What are your expectations and, and wishes from the international community? And may, maybe you can be a little bit more concrete when you mean be with us. Gracias, eh, Mitra. Bueno, pues primero decir que si Thank you, Mitra. The first thing that I would say is that the accompaniment of the international community and international aid has made it possible in Colombia to undertake this exercise that we've had as the Truth Commission. And we wouldn't have been able to guarantee the gender focus or approach here in the country without the collaboration of the international community who had prior experience with this topic. And of course, this approach has uh, been opposed by many sectors in Colombia. During the peace process, you know that there was a plebiscite, a referendum. And at that time, uh, they, there was a campaign around what they called, or it was misnamed, but it was called uh, the gender ideology, saying that that was what peace was trying to move forward. And so at that time, the international community helped. We asked for them to continue accompanying so civil society organizations with pedagogy to keep working with LGBT organizations, victims organizations, women's organizations, so that we're able to have a presence in all of Colombia's territories. We also ask the international community to accompany us, particularly in what are recommendations for non-repetition, which are focused at the state, at civil society, or the responsible parties so that we can have uh, territorial policies implemented, because that's how we're going to see transformation. You talked about this transition and transformation. And so we know how important this is for non-repetition. That's why we ask you to continue accompanying us. And so that you can help the Truth Commission have our recommendations implemented, respected, and guarantee the participation of women who have been with us as the Commission, but who were the, the ones responsible for this country even having a gender approach within the peace agreement. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Salome. Um, Tekla, uh, what are your 
wishes, expectations from the International Commission. Now it's, it's already some years ago that you published your report. And mm -hmm. I mean, now you're in front of elections and I think the, the temperature is quite tight and you have these peace processes. Mm -hmm. um, I think the international community was involved during the mediation process that uh, gave birth to the peace accord that gave birth to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Initially, we had a Kofi Annan office that monitored the process during the setting up of the peace, uh, the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission. And they were offering that oversight, that monitoring. I think the mistake they did was to drop it after we completed their work. They thought the work is finished. I don't think it's not. I was impressed when I was at the Croc Institute uh, last year in November, and I met uh, Josefina, and Josefina shared how they are journeying with the Zida Colombian uh, Truth Commission. That was very encouraging. I think they should continue with them uh, even after completing uh, the work to ensure the implementation of the recommendations of uh, the truth seeking process. In Kenya, the mistake the act did was to mandate the parliament to sanction, that it was parliament to sanction the implementation of the report. Yet most of parliamentarians, most of top leaders were implicated in the report. And some of the recommendations, we, uh, we came up with illustration. They are not supposed to hold any jobs. They are holding top position jobs. Uh, another one was further investigation leading to prosecution. They are in parliament. How do you expect them even to sanction uh, the implementation of the report? So that is one thing. If the international community will have continued to monitor, ensure that the report is implemented, it will have been better. Another chance we lost is that uh, what truth commissions do is to put a nation into a dialogue mode. But truth commissions are a short term. Ours was two and a half. We had extension, we went for four years. But by the time we finished, Kenyans, through the media were aware and they had that dialogue. I think uh, where uh, we missed out is the civil society just to focus on the truth commission. Uh, after that, I don't know what they expected. For me, they should have picked up some of the loose hanging fruits, like continued dialogue in the communities, like trauma healing in the communities, issues of uh, uh, soft justice, like restorative justice, even as they leave others like retributive justice to uh, the government to deal with that. And I think I was among the people who were mourning because having taken over the commission when it had challenges, I was sort of the face of the commission. And for a long time, I continued mourning, having raised the expectation of victims, survivors, witnesses who came through the commission and nothing has happened. But then I went to, um, I was in uh, Germany, Berlin for a fellowship with Robert Bush Academy. And I did a quick research on why government spent a lot of money setting up truth commissions and they don't end up implementing the recommendations. And I, what I learned, it was not just for Kenyans. I think no nation is ready to look itself in the mirror to see how dirty they are. And so I interviewed people from, uh, I think, Brazil, from Canada, from South Africa, from Germany itself, and I realized. And what made our situation worse was the justice component. So when I came up, I said, well, I'm a resource. I can go to the community to support at least what I'm able as a peace builder. And I picked the issue of trauma healing 
because truth commissions really, really traumatize the people, almost the, the whole nation. And I, I thought I should go back to the community to support that. But you know what? They, I think where the international community should come in is to support. I'm here in Nairobi because of the little cash that I had, I had run out. And yet there is so much massive trauma, especially in the area where we, we picked as a case study, where we had a, a militia group and a military operation. You can imagine what the two uh, operations did to the community. So I think um, journeying and, and then amplifying the, fo the voice. Honestly, I did not know that, uh, Mintra, I did not know that uh, this uh, process that you've had with my sisters from Philippines, uh, from Nepal and Colombia was on because I have so much yearned to pick this report, pick the women chapter and simplify it and get back to the women because really rural, no rural woman will come and pick that report. In fact, the report is not available because it was stifled to pick some of the, like I have all the handsets. I just wanted to pick up something that is reader friendly for that rural woman, uh, but we've lost that. So yeah, there is a lot that uh, international community can support, continue to dialogue, supporting the civil society, continuing dialogue, uh, trauma healing, uh, restorative justice, and monitoring the, the implementation of the report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, we're just a little bit over the time, but I think it's worse to continue a little bit some question. I hope that's fine and we can take um, this together before. I think this is very important, but, but you were now talking about how important are these monitoring measures. Um, yeah, often um, the transitional justice institutions, they have a very short mandate and, and then they are closed. And, and what is afterwards the process to monitor that? And I think this was already important, but what you said about that. Um, and there were some questions also in, in, in this regard. Um, and maybe I will, I will just bring it in and, and one, Something was not clear what is mean by the international guarantee. I think, Yasmin, you mentioned that, just to pick it up. And then, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I have it here. Um, yeah, one question is how do you ensure that that peace agreement can seriously be implemented? I, I think we are never sure what, what we also have, have shown. It's, it's also a question of political will, but there are some issues um, we can we can pressure. And you already mentioned um, building up monitoring mechanisms international mechanism. I also think the Colombian model with the Kroc Institute, it, it, it's a very good model, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. And I think it's worth to make another session once about monitoring mechanisms. By the way, Karen Tanada is in the monitoring committee of the, of the Philippine uh, peace process. Maybe Karen, you can say some words about that. That would be interesting. Um, yeah, we'll just put this now in, in, in the group who would like to, to, yeah, what do you mean by international um, guarantee? And uh, what, what are the, the strategies to ensure that the peace agreements are seriously implemented? Just two questions for the moment who would like to answer. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I, what I mentioned was the guarantee of non-recurrence or non-repetition uh, uh, 
to be as that that's the that's the reason why I said the international community should be with us all the way to ensure that the guarantee of non-recurrence or non-repetition uh, does not happen. And uh, I forgot to mention, as uh, what Nitra said, Karen is part of the third party monitoring team, which is uh, one of the part of the Philippine architecture. And, and they've been monitoring the implementation of the agreement since the beginning uh, until now. And I guess until uh, we're able to reach a certain um, because in the agreement, it talks about exit agreement where both parties, the MILF and the government can now say that they have fully implemented the provisions in the peace agreement. So uh, I think that's an important uh, component of this, uh, the Philippine experience. Uh, I think one of the, uh, one of the, uh, um, measure that's also necessary in the implementation of the peace agreement is to make it into a national law. And that's what happened with the Philippine uh, process. After we did not stop with the signing of the agreement, but we pushed for it to be part of the Philippine constitution so that what whoever is the administration, whoever becomes the president of the republic, is bound to commit to implement because it's already part of the law of the land. And I think uh, that's one important uh, 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 step. You no, know, uh, that is uh, to ensure that it becomes it becomes institutionalized by by way of a law and becomes a part of the constitution. And that's why. After that, uh, a plebiscite was done and the Bangsamoro uh, government was put in place because without that, we won't be able to uh, create the new political entity uh, that, will, uh, that will be the, the, the expression of our aspiration uh, as a people. And so now, as what we've said, uh, after the put after the law, we now have the political entity, uh, the space, the political uh, space, which is the Bangsamoro government, and then a Bangsamoro transition authority was put in place, tasked to craft the building of the institution of the Bangsamoro government, and it has been uh, it's now in its second extension. It is now in its first extension. Uh, it was created uh, and has a uh, three-year lifespan. And as what Mitra said, um, the, the president signed its extension for another three years. And the idea of the extension is to prepare for the democratic uh, election in 2025, where uh, the Bangsamoro political entity is now able to... Uh, Function uh, based on uh, what we what the the both parties have agreed upon, and so as I've said, this is where the international community uh, is uh, again uh, will have to play an important role uh, to help uh, shepherd and to help uh, the institutionalization of of the peace agreement in the Bangsamoro, as well as in the national government. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody want to add on that? Sí, Mitra, yo quisiera eh, agregar algo, poco sobre... Yes, I'd like to add something about what could be the strategies to help implement the recommendations for non-repetition. We've learned, of course, a lot from the other truth commissions. As you've mentioned, Jasmine, for example, your analysis about the meaning of these commissions, which is really our greatest challenge, that a truth commission can offer something concretely to victims. And of course, it's essential. What we want is the accompaniment of international organizations. 
What we ask of you is that you get to know very well the recommendations that we're making. Because sometimes people understand them in, in, in general terms about the changes that are recommended about maybe rural development, these things that were discussed in the peace agreement. And of course, there are other recommendations that are going to be specifically about a gender approach, about political, social, and cultural rights, LGBTI population, women, their rights to education, their right to comprehensive uh, health services, sexual health, mental health, reproductive health rights, especially because they suffered uh, sexual abuses as women. So we've had to carry out pedagogy and I think that we need a company for accompaniment for that because we need to raise awareness about the recommendations that we'll make so that women can adopt these and take possession of the recommendations themselves in their territories, whether it's in the Caribbean, in Southern Colombia, so that they can take these recommendations upon themselves, just like the government and so that there can be a dialogue between victims, organizations, governments, local governments, so they can continue to um, working on a peace agenda with a gender approach. This is a country that has actually a lot of, a lot on the books in terms of the law that favors women. So what we need is for these recommendations to be included in governance. We have a complex context. We're about, we're, we're right now in the presidential election cycle. So we want this report to come out in that context, of course, the recommendations will be important as well as the backing of the international community because as Jasmine was saying, these are agreements that need to be implemented no matter who's in power, whoever is president, whoever the government in power is at the time, so that this agenda doesn't get pushed on the back burner, but so that there's pressure for the government truly to implement it in the short, medium, and long term. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just, as we are already over past a little bit our time, just take like, would you like to, to add something on that or on an issue before? Um, I think the idea of ensuring the implementation uh, is put into the law is very key. And that is the mistake that we did in Kenya. Uh, in fact, anything that concerns the law, really the leaders are hesitant to change. Like they have really tried to change the act, some of the aspects of the act that created the commission so that they can make changes on the report but because the act is there, they have not been able to. Another way is about lobbying and advocacy. But as you had mentioned in the report, uh, the civil society space has really been shrinking in Africa. Uh, and uh, with the uh, now, Africa, not just focused, of course, during the lobbying and advocacy, when we were pushing for the constitutional review to open up spaces for political uh, competition, we had a lot of backing from the Western uh, world, the Western organizations, World Bank, IMF, uh, USA, 
But now with the liberal and the opening up of China, even the international community that should have supported us to lobby for the implementation, they don't have a stick, leave alone a carrot to tango for the government to listen to them because they were using aid. And now if the Western refuse to give Kenya aid, we look into Asia and there is China. So that is the, it's, it's, it's really challenging. That is the dilemma in which we are in. Thank you. Thank you, Tekla. Um, Socorro, uh, you wanted to add something. No, yo, yo reitero que la cooperación es muy importante. I just like to reiterate that international cooperation is very important, specifically to have international dialogue spaces in different multilateral forums to position what is happening, uh, what comes out of the Truth Commission and to have public debates and consultations. This is also useful for the institutions and the international organizations because many are still in this mindset that cooperation is res restricted to economic cooperation, which obviously is very important, but, but also acting as a spokespeople for us is very valuable in your countries where hopefully you feel legitimate in being our spokespeople in different spaces. So this report isn't just a report that will sit on the desk and, and collect dust. It needs to be a tool used by the organizations. And so that's why international cooperation will continue to be crucial to continue strengthening women's leadership as key actors and key thinkers people who are creating new ideas and initiatives that are able to transform society. Women, we are more and more in the different spaces, which is very important to share our knowledges and the logics of our life experience, and that these can be shared with respect and a lot of empathy so the people know and can see the ideas of women and that we can continue exchanging experiences. I think there's something that's key, that there's a space to exchange experiences between countries and to have this intercultural dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sukuru. Unfortunately, we, we have to come to an end, well, just for the moment. I mean, hopefully, hopefully we will continue our discussions, exchanges, learning processes from each other and continue with our engagement for a <coughs> gender just peaceful world. So I, I will give thank you so much to all of you participating. I will give the floor to Susan Rizal for the final remarks. Thank you so much, Mitra. <laughs> I was just listening to very insightful discussion, especially expressed by uh, Sokoro and then Solome, Yashmin, Tekla. I don't know whether Tekla, you're also a friend of Angie, I guess. Uh, once I have also sent my PhD proposal to you, you looked at that and also gave your feedback. I don't know whether you remember that or not. <laughs> but it is, so, <laughs> it is so inspiring, you know, listening to you, all of you. Actually, thank you so much. Uh, and also, firstly, I'd like to express uh, our, uh, actually from all, on behalf of all the, you know, participants, let's say, not only the authors of this um, uh, publication uh, from transition to transformation, but all the participants for organizing such a you know, beautiful 
uh, event actually uh, where we women rarely get this kind of um, uh, space to talk about our experiences of women building peace in our respective countries. First, thank you so much for the peace women across the globe, Mitra, Andrea, and I'm also remembering Florina <laughs> and also Gabby who conceptualized this organization, Peace Women Across the Globe, uh, which we really found you know, around the globe, which mostly talk about or give space for especially the, the peace agendas, uh, transforming structural violence, and focusing on, especially on to the women and also the LGBTI community. That's what we really found, find in our um, in our experiences. Uh, and um, um, listening to you all, and we have we all have different kind of context, uh, especially from Nepal to Philippines to Ke Kenya to uh, Kenya to also to Colombia. And uh, I, I was really reflecting that uh, at least there are lots of women's participation in the peace process, especially into the negotiation process, especially in Philippines and also in Kenya. And also there is also the gender working group in uh, Colombian uh, transitional justice process. But here in Nepal, that process was missed out, you know, while while there was peace agreement was happening, there was no participation of women, but listening to uh, Yasmin especially, it is really inspiring and also listening to, listening to Tekla and also, you know, observing especially the gender working group in Colombia, it is really a kind of learning moment for Nepal also, that's what I really feel. And also, in the process itself, the writing of this uh, book, as uh, Andrea presented very nicely, uh, it was in the time of COVID. Actually, it was the the idea was germinated while we were in Switzerland, especially for the um, a kind of uh, a conference where that kind of conference also that kind of workshop also we rarely get very uh, intimate space that we got in uh, in 2019. Then after that, all the world stopped. And, uh, but we, the, it is uh, uh, from the, you know, the lead of Peace Women across the globe. It is all the hard work from Mitra and Andrea. They just move forward the process and imposing all of us to engage in this process. And thank you so much, Mitra. And it was a wonderful journey, although I was in a very um, a kind of um, dealing with my personal challenges, but the process itself was very beautiful. And thank you so much for you know, creating those spaces and also the questions that raised by the participants about the, you know, the monitoring mechanisms, the, uh, the support of the international communities. When there was there is a big war is happening around the globe. Like in, initially it was Afghanistan, now it, and now it is in Ukraine. And most of the international communities are focusing on to this area, but especially the structural violence that was uh, still remains in the post-conflict uh, countries. It is not in the priority of the international communities, and that what we all have been urging uh, to all the international communities do not stop to help those kind of uh, post-conflict countries who still need this kind of support uh, in our respective countries also. And also the most important thing, all of you highlighted that the political will to, you know, to, to um, um, give the logical end to the transitional justice process. It is very necessary. And also it is also highlighted by all the speakers that the transition the, the only completing of the transitional justice process, whether it will be, you know, completing uh, you know, effectively or not in our respective countries, peace process will not be completed because the structure, the root causes and the driver of the conflict still remains in our society. And that what we all have to, you know, make our effort to address those kind of issues and challenging the patriarchy and also the normative framework of violence has always been necessary. And thank you so much, everyone. 
for participating in this uh, event. And thank you, Mitra, Andrea, uh, Solome. It is so nice to see you after a long time. Yasmin, Corinne, Tekla, Socorro, everyone. And remembering again, Florina, Gabby, and every participant who raised the questions and listened to our uh, journey. And uh, we, we are just the means to bringing out the stories of our women whose voices or whose stories have never been heard by our transitional justice process, but it will be the means, it will be the learning materials for the peace practitioners around the world and who have been also focusing on their work into this area. Thank you so much, Mitra, and thank you so much, and thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, too. Gracias. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, nice, nice evening to all in the, uh, the Western part of the world and good day for those in, in, in Colombia. And hopefully we'll see us soon again. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you as well for the interpre interpreters and yeah, and I all understand. the technical support of our. Thank you. Bye. Thanks bye so bye. much to everyone. Bye. Goodbye Thank to you. everyone listening. Bye. bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you.